What's up, everybody? How's it going? Oh, actually, I'll be right back. better now i can see and now you can hear me hey everybody welcome back to the emerald crusader live stream i am isaiah and i am very excited for today because we are doing another installment of one of my favorite series on the channel and that would be thoughtful thursday so for those of you new to the channel thoughtful thursday is basically just a lot of information about uh history science smart people that kind of stuff really the whole point to it is just to inspire us to think more inspire myself and others to learn more and always be curious and that kind of thing so with that being said i have several different segments for us to go through over the next half hour so if that sounds interesting to you join me as we go about thoughtful thursday so first up on this day in history so on january 14th in 1693 it was a very important day because in hartford connecticut the first constitution in the american colonies the fundamental orders is adopted by the representatives of Wethersfield, Windsor, and Hartford in Connecticut. So that's the first uh, American constitution. Uh, then, uh, it, this, this is just a big day for constitutional documents in the Americas. Uh, in eight, or I'm sorry, in 1784, on January 14th, the Continental Congress ratifies the Treaty of Paris ending the war for independence. The document, which was known as the Second Treaty of Paris because the Treaty of Paris was also the name of the agreement that had ended the Seven Years' War in 1763, Britain officially agreed to recognize the independence of the 13 former colonies as the new United States of America. So pretty pretty big day in history for american documents but probably the biggest event that occurred on january 14th is the one i'm about to mention in 1970 when the group known as diana ross and the supremes performed their final concert together they were the most successful American pop group of the 1960s, a group whose 12 number one hits in the first full decade of rock and roll era places them behind only Elvis and the Beatles in terms of chart dominance. They helped define the very sound of the 60s, but like fellow icons, the Beatles and Simon and Garfunkel, they, be they came apart in the first year of the 70s. The certain the curtain closed for good on Diana Ross and the Supremes on January 14th, 1970 at the Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. So, tragic day for us. That, uh, that's when the Supremes and Diana Ross forever split. And supposedly, it was because of a competition between an artificial competition between Diana Ross and their record label at the time and they put Di they they build Diana Ross above the Diana Ross and the Supremes group and that kind of sowed the demise of the Supremes and that in the spirit of poorly put together competitions that end badly also in the spirit of poorly put together segues Let's talk about something in history that didn't happen, happen on today. I want to talk about the 1904 Olympics Men's Marathon. 
The men's marathon at the 1904 Summer Olympics in St. Louis, United States, took place at on August 30th of that year, and it was over a distance of 24.85 miles. 32 athletes representing four nations competed, but only 14 managed to finish the race, which proved to be a pretty bizarre affair altogether. This, I mean, this this story just just kept getting weirder and weirder the more I looked into it. So, the first person to arrive at the finish line was this guy here, Fred Lors, who had actually dropped out of the race after the ninth mile and hitched a ride back to the stadium in a car waving at spectators and runners alike during the ride. When the car broke down at the 19th mile, Lors re-entered the race and jogged across the finish line. After being hailed as the winner, he had his photograph taken with Alice Roosevelt, daughter of then US President Theodore Roosevelt, and was about to be awarded the gold medal when his little charade was brought to light. Upon being confronted by the officials, Lors immediately admitted his deception and despite his claims of joking and the AAU responded by banning him for a year but he would later to go uh, he would later go on to win the Boston Marathon in 1905 in spite of that banning <laughs> so then the person who actually ended up being being deemed the winner I should say rather than winning the race was Thomas Hicks and the way he won would probably not be allowed these days, I'm assuming. <laughs> so, 10 miles from the finish line, Hicks led the race by a mile and a half, but he had to be restrained from stopping and lying down by his trainers. From then until the end of the race, Hicks received several doses of strychnine strychnine the rat poison which stimulates the nervous system in small doses they would mix that with brandy and they would give it to this guy he continued to battle onward hallucinating and barely able to walk for most of the remainder of the course when he reached the stadium his support team carried him over the finish line holding him in the air while he shuffled his feet as if he was still running <laughs> Higgs had to be carried off the track and might have died in the stadium if it had not been for several doctors right there ready to treat him he lost a total of eight pounds over the course of the race so yeah, his, I, I guess his trainers thought microdoses of strychnine would numb the nervous system in some way. I I don't know, uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, he ended up uh, getting the gold medal for the men's marathon, dosed up on strychnine and brandy. And then another near fatality during the event was William Garcia of the United States. He was found lying in the road along the marathon course with several internal injuries caused by breathing in clouds of dust kicked up by the race official's car. We'll touch on that a little bit later, but yeah, another guy that almost died. Uh, a postman from Cuba joined the marathon arriving at the very last minute. After losing all of his money in New Orleans, Louisiana, he hitchhiked to St. Louis and had to run the event in street clothes that he cut around his legs to make them look like shorts, and you can see that in this picture here. <laughs> Not having eaten in 40 hours, he was trying to run a marathon, so he just so happened to come across an apple orchard along, along the route of the marathon and so he stopped to grab a couple of apples because he just I guess over the course of hitchhiking to the event he just never had time to get anything to eat 
Unfortunately for him, the apple tree turned out to be rotten. Rotten apples cause him to have strong stomach cramps and have to lie down and take a nap. Despite falling ill from the apples and taking a nap, he finished in fourth place. <laughs> the marathon also included the first two black Americans to compete, or I'm sorry, the black, black Africans to compete in the Olympics. Two Swana tribesmen named Len Tao and uh, Hua, or uh, Yan Mashani, I'm sorry. Len Tao finished ninth and Mashiani came in 12th. This was a huge disappointment, especially to bookies at the time, as they were sure Len Tao could have done better but unfortunately, along the course, he was chased almost a mile off of the track by a pack of wild dogs. <laughs> Just pack of wild dogs ch chasing some random guy off of the track for a mile. But apparently he managed to shake them and then work his way back to the course and still finish ninth even. So that's that's pretty amazing. I mean, also, it's just impressive to have finished this race because again, only 14 guys out of 32 altogether finished the race. And that's because of a few really, really bad ideas that went into the setup of the race much less the execution for one thing the only water stop along the entire 25 mile route was 11 miles in and that was it in spite of it being 90 degrees outside also in spite of it being 90 degrees outside Unlike most races that try to take advantage of the cool morning hours, this marathon happened to start in the afternoon. Again, 90 degrees outside, one water stop. And then another really, really poor thought out thing about this race was the race began and ended in the stadium, but the rest of the course around it was just dusty old country roads. And with race officials in, in vehicles ahead of and behind the runners, it was just creating clouds of dust that everyone was inhaling while they were trying to run this 25 mile marathon. And uh, again, William Garcia almost died from it. So yeah, 1904 men's marathon, probably the biggest joke to ever have been put together as far as sporting events go but now I want to move on to something we've we we've all we've evolved a lot since then in the Olympics and we've also evolved in a lot of other ways not necessarily in my segues I know that but in other ways so I want to talk about one of the oldest things that we've been using and a very very interesting new innovation in the field let's talk about concrete concrete has been around for forever invented over 2000 years ago it has remained one of the most used materials on the only other more used materials on the planet is water so the second most used material in the entire world. But the science behind it hasn't really changed all that much over those 2000 years since its invention. It's basically just been a mix of cement, water, and other things like sand and gravel and other aggregates, seashells, what have you. But there's still a lot of big issues with concrete even though it has a lot of benefits which is why it is so wildly widely used one of the biggest issues with concrete is that it is susceptible to cracks and this can compromise entire structures if the crack is in the wrong place 
Thanks to their innovations, though, scientists have revolutionized the industry with the development that may bring the days of cracks in concrete to an end. What is that invention? Living concrete. Over the years, scientists and engineers around the globe have experimented with various healing agents to perfect self-healing or also known as living concrete out of bacteria. Self-healing concrete was invented by Heinrich Jonkers, a microbiologist and professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Yonkers began developing self-healing concrete in 2006. After three years of experimenting, he found the perfect healing agent, Bacillus. In a CNN interview, Yonkers said, You need bacteria that can survive the harsh environment of concrete. Bacillus is basically perfect for this job. The bacteria will thrive in high alkaline conditions like concrete and produce spores that can live for up to four years without any food or oxygen. Yonkers finalized his creation by adding calcium lactate to the limestone concrete mixture in order to feed the bacillus so that they can produce limestone to repair cracks in concrete. Another quote from Yonkers is, it is combining nature and construction materials. Nature is supplying us with a lot of functionality for free. In this case, limestone producing bacteria. The revolutionary technology could not only help maintain the integrity of structures through time, making it safer and more secure, but it also helps cut down on the expensive costs around maintaining more involved concrete structures like uh i mean a crack in the driveway is one thing but when you're talking about a crack in something like a bridge or a dam or a nuclear waste facility or things like that not only does it get significantly more dangerous to go about those repairs but also significantly more expensive so this would help cut down a lot on that routine maintenance Another thing that it would help with is the environment. Over 9% of the CO2 emissions worldwide come from cement production. So this drop in maintenance and increase in longevity also significantly decreases those CO2 emission totals. So I really want to, that being said, I really want to quickly listen to this clip from Professor Yonkers just describing it a little bit further. So what we do is we replace the stones for hollow spheres, which we fill with food and bacteria and add that to the concrete mixture. Here we see an example of a piece of uh, cracked concrete. You can see the crack and even the big hole. Here you can see that the bacteria have closed the crack and even the big hole completely filled with uh, calcium carbonate. So that's Dr. Yonkers and yeah, like the, like the, like he said in the, in the video, it can cut down immensely on costs and immensely on emissions and it is water reactive. So whenever you get a crack, that's the, that's the huge vulnerability with cracks 
is that when they get water in them, especially in certain climates that get below freezing, that water can freeze and then it expands, making the crack worse and worse. This kind of takes advantage of that flaw to where the the bacteria lies dormant until it's activated by water and then the the bacillus gets going at eating away at that calcium lactate and as it's eating away it's digesting out limestone filling in the crack i mean it's it's amazing technology so that's really cool and i'm excited that that is supposed to hit the new york stock exchange very soon so we might be seeing this hit a lot of new construction developments almost being built exclusively with this stuff so that'll be exciting to not only see how that's implemented but also really testing the longevity of it and see if it holds up so i'm really excited about that but that is talking about the 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 dirt and the rocks and the ground and the land i want to change our direction up to the stars as we go into our bio segment to talk about a really really smart person so the really smart person that i want to talk about today is margaret j geller margaret j geller was born on december 8 1947 and she is an american astro astrophysicist rather at the harvard smithsonian center for astrophysics her work has included pioneering maps for the nearby universe, studies of the relationship between galaxies and their environment, and the development and application of methods for measuring the distribution of matter in the universe. She made pioneering maps of large-scale structures of the universe, which led to the discovery of the galactic superstructure properly known as the great wall this is the largest known superstructure in the universe and she's the one that discovered it geller was all has also developed innovative tech techniques for investigating the internal structure and the total mass of clusters of galaxies and the relationship of clusters to large-scale structures so she she pretty much developed how to measure galaxies and how to determine their place in the universe and has also determined their pattern of spacing in the universe. It's the the work she's done is really really cool stuff. So she also is a co-discoverer of hypervelocity stars, stars ejected at high velocity from the galactic center. These stars can travel across the Milky Way and may be important tracers of the distribution of matter in the galaxy. Geller's current main research interests include a project she leads called the Smithsonian Hectoscope or Hectospec lensing survey or shells for short uh, this uses the phenomenon of gravitational lensing to map the distribution of the mysterious ubiquitous dark matter in the universe so she's one of the uh, 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 pioneering researchers also of dark matter she is also investigating the implications of the discovery of hypervelocity stars as well as heading up the a project called Hectomap, which uses large databases of information to map clusters of galaxies and which in turn aids us in understanding how these systems develop over the history of the universe she is the recipient of numerous awards including and i'm gonna butcher some of these pronunciations but just so many freaking awards here <laughs> she's very prestigious uh including the julius edgar linenfeld prize of the american physical society in 2013 the henry norris russell lectureship of the american Astron astronomical society in 2010 
the James Craig Watson Medal of the National Academy of Sciences in 2010, the uh, Magellan the Magellan Magellanic. Ugh, I cannot pronounce that right now. Magellanic Premium of the American Philosophical Society in 2008, among several other that I'm uh, the, I'm uh, I'm done butchering those, but she's. Also a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science and a fellow of the American Physical Society. In 1990, she was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Two years later, she was elected to the physics section of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. From 2000 to 2003, she served as the Council of the National she served on the Council of the National Academy of Sciences. She has received several honorary, or I'm sorry, seven, seven honorary degrees. And, and I mean, she's, she's pioneered so much in physics. Just what she's discovered alone is amazing, but also what she's done in in the field as far as advancement for women goes is also just as amazing i mean the physical science as it's described to me is a total boys club and she really not only showed how far a women a woman can go but how what they can do in that field very early on this is back in the 70s and 80s and 90s when she was doing a large portion of her work so she's an awesome smart person and when i was doing my research about her one of my favorite parts was this clip that i'm getting ready to play because you could tell so much that even after decades of working in the field she still had so much enthusiasm enthusiasm about the work that she was do doing and the level of curiosity and wonder that she has in her eye is almost childlike and it's it, it's a wonderful little clip from her and it it also ends with a wonderful quote from her but before i play that i just want to say thanks again for coming and dropping into the stream if you like this i Go, I will be back here next Thursday doing another Thoughtful Thursday. If you really like this, join me tomorrow for my book club for Chai Friday. We are finishing the part one of Stephen King's Salem's Lot. So if you want to come discuss that with me, come on and hang out at 6. Uh, then on Saturday, I'm going to do a 30-minute deep dive into something random. That's going to be called Weekend Deep End at six as well then i'll be back on monday for music monday where i do a couple of segments based around music and then i will be back again on wednesday to do another willpower wednesday where i do a short story to hopefully inspire us to have more willpower so with that being said thank you again for joining me and Take it away, Dr. Geller. This story is as big as it gets. It's really the longest journey a human being can take. It's a journey to the outer reaches of the universe. And here's the question. How are the tens of billions of galaxies inside this universe of ours distributed? Are they scattered randomly, or is there some kind of pattern? Margaret Geller began her quest to map the universe in the 1970s. We were limited to using a very small telescope, and it was a slow process, 25 minutes a galaxy. 25 minutes to determine each galaxy's 3D position. The latitude and longitude are easy. They come from the image that the telescope takes. But galaxies don't come with little tags saying how far away they are. And so what's an astrophysicist to do but get clever by measuring something called the redshift? And we do that by spreading the light of a galaxy out into its colors. Then we can see features that tell us how rapidly it appears to move away from us. The faster a galaxy's moving away, the more we see its light getting stretched towards longer wavelengths and the larger the redshift. 
that's proportional to the distance, so that's how we know how far away a galaxy is. Now, Geller couldn't survey the entire sky. It's the classic too much universe, too little time problem. Let's suppose you were going to see the Earth for the first time, and you wanted to know, does it have continents and oceans? Well, if you take a small patch, it won't tell you anything. But if you take a great circle in almost any orientation, it'll pass through continents and oceans, and it'll tell you the Earth has two kinds of structures, both big. In the universe, of course, it's a 3D place. So the analogy is you take an orange and you cut a slice in it. So we observed galaxies in a slice of the universe. And it worked. She and her colleagues plotted the locations of a thousand different galaxies up to 700 million light years away. When we saw the data, there was this glorious pattern. The galaxies are all in very thin structures which surround or nearly surround vast dark regions where there are very few, if any, galaxies. And it was known that there were clusters of galaxies, but what wasn't known was what was the general structure of the universe. This was a first time you could really see it, patterns that extend for hundreds of millions of light years. In her subsequent maps, like this one, that went way deeper and contained tens of thousands of galaxies, the pattern held. Margaret Geller and her two colleagues had found the continents and oceans of our universe. For that moment, you're the only three that know it. That's it. Of the billions of people in the world, it's yours. And so for that moment, you own the universe. And then Geller gave the universe to the world, helping reshape not just our understanding of how matter is distributed in space, but also how that matter got there. You see, there's a kind of faint radiation that fills outer space called cosmic microwave background. It's a remnant of the early universe. That radiation has little tiny ripples in it. Ripples in temperature. Some regions are just a little bit hotter or just a little bit cooler than others. And those differences in temperature are related to differences in the density of matter of the early universe. So what happens is that gravity amplifies these ripples in the matter distribution. And so in an expanding universe, two things happen, gravity likes to make lumps. And it also turns out that gravity likes to make holes. If you start a hole, gravity will make the hole bigger. And that makes the structure that we observe today. On cosmic scales, it's all about gravity. But on human size scales, for Margaret Geller, it's about something else. The journeys that we take in science are journeys of the imagination. It's a measure of our curiosity and our reach. It's what makes us grand, in my opinion.